So diplomacy is the ability to influence foreign government officials, but also foreign populations to change their behavior in ways that are in the interest of the United States. And of course, what we hope is also in their interest. And the way that we engage in diplomacy is direct bilateral negotiations with foreign government officials, public diplomacy, where we reach out to the populations, to civil society, to have discussions, negotiations, to promote our values, to promote our interests. Multilateral diplomacy, where we work in either international organizations or in a collection of countries, where we negotiate treaties, arrangements, agreements, and then, of course, there's consular diplomacy where we assist and protect U.S. citizens abroad and facilitate travel to the United States. I was in the Peace Corps in Tunisia, and that's the first time I really even knew that embassies existed. I must admit that as a Peace Corps volunteer, I was like, well, I don't have anything to do with those government people in the capital. I'm out, you know, in the desert learning what it's really like to live in Tunisia. And then later, um, when I was looking for work and deciding that I wanted to go back overseas, I remembered those people in the embassy and I thought, you know, I wonder if I could do that. And that's when I joined the Foreign Service. So in a nutshell, consular officers assist and protect U.S. citizens abroad. And that means that we provide them routine services like passports, um, consular reports of birth abroad, but also emergency services. We evacuate them whenever a country is, you know, going in turmoil or we assist them if they're arrested. But we also facilitate travel to the United States, which is to make sure that the right people get visas to come to the United States so they can travel, study, get to know the United States, but also make sure that the wrong people aren't let in, people who want to do us harm, we protect our borders against those people. Well, it means that, you know, if there is somebody who wishes us harm, we want to keep them away from the United States. And so if we can keep them outside our borders, that means the homeland is not at risk. Um, so really, the ability to make sure that those people don't enter the United States is critical. Well, it's really interesting because it's really the first type of services that we provided uh, in the diplomatic arena overseas. We made sure that American seamen were taken care of. Um, so it's an old, old service to make sure that our citizens, when they're in a foreign country, are treated fairly, are treated equally with those citizens, and make sure they have some form of representation. Um, and this is one of the oldest diplomatic traditions there is. You know, I think a lot of people think we can get them out of jail. <laughs> and what we do is make sure they're treated fairly and equally, that they're not being disadvantaged because they're American. But unfortunately, we can't spring them out of jail. Sometimes I wish we could. Absolutely. You know, in the past, basically, you know, consular officers were poorly paid. They paid themselves out of the fees that they collected. We had the diplomatic corps, which were basically the elite that, you know, weren't professional. And I think the Congress rightfully decided, wait a minute, if we're going to represent the United States appropriately, if we're going to further our interests, if we're going to gain what the United States needs, and we want to make sure American citizens are protected, we need a professional core of people well-trained who are serving in the interests of the United States, not in their own personal interests, and not because they come from a wealthy family, but because they believe in the United States and in U.S. goals and policies. You know, the best way we project our values is we live our values. Um, we also talk about our values, but when they see us live our values, that is critically important. So, for example, when I was in India as the uh, U.S. Consul General, I would talk about gender equality, and I would go out as a woman, and I would speak to groups. A lot, a lot of times I would speak to companies, and I would talk about the value of gender equality. 
But they also saw that I embodied gender equality. I talked about my father and how important he was to make sure I got access to everything my brother had access to. And they, they could see there's another way of doing things. So when they could actually see a US diplomat living the values that we hold dear in America, that has the greatest impact. Of course, we also promote our values through you know, a variety of cultural events, through speeches, through, you know, a, a whole variety of different different forms, but honestly, the most effective is when they see us live U.S. values. I think right now it's incredible. I mean, I have to say, like, I feel very equal in the world of diplomacy. It is a challenge. There are always challenges um, in some countries. Uh, there's a very good example, again, from India, where as the U.S. Consul General, I was in a meeting and basically I was placed with the women in one area and the men were in the other, which is their culture, that is their tradition. But I got up and I said, I'm gonna go over and join the men. And what was great is the women followed me. And we continued, we had a very nice meeting and people weren't offended because I was nice about it, I was charming about it. But I also realized that that was when some of our cultural differences you know, came into play. So it, it is sometimes a struggle as a woman, um, particularly in cultures where they discriminate against women, but it's also a huge benefit. I have to say, I would get meetings because people thought, what a charming woman, I think I'd like to meet with her. Um, not because I was a US Consul General, but that gave me access. I accessed in the Middle East a lot of very important men through their wives. I would go have tea with the wives and eventually you know meet the husband in a more relaxed setting than in the office and that's where diplomacy also can be so much more effective I mean when you're really developing relationships with people and then you have to have a hard conversation that's when they're going to listen to you um, so I've actually found more benefits from being a woman than any of the detriments Oh, that's a hard question. I'm not sure I have like the one fondest memory. I, you know, I do have to say when, when, when I walked into our orientation class, what we call A100, I really felt like I belonged. Like I really felt like this was the career I belonged in. And I have so many fond memories of serving in the Foreign Service that I'm going to have to think for just a little bit and try to give you a few. Well, I have to say I'm a single woman and um, a life abroad in some pretty tough countries like Kuwait and Israel and Rwanda aren't the most conducive to dating. And so I probably have sacrificed um, what would maybe be a, a woman's traditional you know, career or life of getting married and having children. Um, I think that would probably be the greatest sacrifice, although it was well worth it, let me tell you. Um, you sacrifice your privacy. We don't have any privacy. And the more senior we got when I was U.S. Consul General in uh, Calcutta, I had no privacy. I was a celebrity. I lived in a huge bubble and really had very little time to myself. Again, a sacrifice worth making. But I think the greatest sacrifice is some of us sacrifice our lives. And I have, I have been close to death several times and where I really thought, oh my God, I'm going to die. Um, and I'm thankful that I haven't had to make the ultimate sacrifice, but I do realize that some of us do, and it's part of my job is to put my life on the line sometimes. Yeah, so I think the time I was the closest to, um, to getting harmed and getting killed was I was in Baghdad. I was the U.S. consul in Baghdad, and I was staying at the Al Rashid Hotel. And I had just woken up, listened to the call to prayer, which I, I really enjoy, and it was the first day of Ramadan, and then just a massive explosion. I mean, the loudest explosion I have ever experienced, and my room just filled with smoke, and didn't really know what was going on. Um, grabbed my phone, grabbed my sandals, rolled out of bed, um, was almost to the stairs when I heard a colleague screaming, saying, my arm, help, my arm. And when I had to turn around and go back into that smoke-filled hallway 
not knowing if more rockets were coming, not knowing what was happening, I realized, okay, I could die. You know, I'm going the wrong way. I should be going out, but I had to go back and was able to help her, was able to um, help her keep her arm and got her to the hospital um, and was glad I did it. But it really did, um, you know, I realized like I, I could have died. I did. You know, I think, I don't think it was heroic. I'll be perfectly honest. I think it was just something a, a human being does to, to help another human being. So I'm still kind of like, wonder why did I get that award? I just did what anybody would have done. <laughs> So I'm, I'm very proud of that award because um, I went to Iraq to assist and protect private U.S. citizens um, living and working and traveling in Iraq. And it was a very dangerous place and it was a very difficult place to be a consular officer because we did not have an embassy. I was reporting to um, Mr. Bremer in his position as presidential envoy but was not part of the coalition provisional authority. I sort of made it up as we, as we went along. Um, but I knew how to assist and protect American citizens, so I spent the time there um, just, you know, giving them information to help keep them safe, setting up a warden system, um, doing town hall meetings so that Americans would know what's going on, documenting U.S. citizens. We had a lot of Iraqis who had come to the United States for their graduate degrees who gave birth in the States, and then those children went back to Iraq and they're U.S. citizens, but they hadn't been documented in 20 years. So I spent a lot of time documenting those citizens. I spent a lot of time, unfortunately, assisting citizens who had been injured, making sure they could get flights out through the military, making sure they got proper medical care. Um, and of course, the most tragic part was documenting the death of the, of the American citizens that tragically died in Iraq. Oh, absolutely integral. I mean, there is, a, a nation cannot promote its interests without diplomacy. Because when you don't have diplomacy, then you have to revert to war. And war is tragic. I, I saw it firsthand in Iraq, and I realized it taught me there is such a tragedy of war. It is a tragedy for our citizens who die, who are injured, who are forever scarred. It is a tragedy for the countries that are engaged. So diplomacy spares us that trauma. Diplomacy ensures that we reach agreements, that we find common ground, that we promote our interests in a nonviolent way. Now, I come from a Mennonite background. My grandparents were Amish, my parents were Mennonite. And of course, we're pacifists, and we believe in promoting um, our interests in a nonviolent way. So I was sort of steeped in nonviolence as a child. And to me, diplomacy is the ultimate in a nation achieving its goals through nonviolence. Well, I think the power bases are very diverse right now. And so it used to be that, wow, you had a bilateral negotiation with a foreign government and the outcome was expected. But right now, we need to work with civil society. We need to influence public opinion. We have power bases that are incredibly diverse which makes it harder because that means diplomacy is not just you and me talking, it's me going on television and talking to the public, it's me talking to NGOs, it's you know me reaching out to a variety of different institutions, which requires a lot more work, it requires a lot more understanding, it requires us to really learn a culture and a country and a language in a way that maybe we didn't have to in the past when bilateral diplomacy was pretty much all that was needed. Technology also is, is just huge. I mean, it's so hard to just keep up with what has changed technologically that changes the nature of what we do. If I am not communicating on Twitter, I have lost the youth of Thailand. I mean, because they are getting their information on Twitter. And I have to understand that constantly as a diplomat and keep up with it and know the latest. Actually, Twitter's probably out of date. I probably don't even know <laughs> what I need to do in Thailand anymore because that was last year. So we really have to keep up with technology. I think this is a huge challenge. And I think diplomats have had that challenge forever. It's not new. Um, we have always had to balance the risk to our safety and security with the need to engage. 
We can't 100% be safe because then we're not engaging with people. But we also don't want to be reckless because we don't want to unnecessarily put ourselves at risk. So every day we have to balance what's our interest? What do we need to get done? What level of risk am I willing to take? What level of risk makes sense to take? And then find an appropriate balance. It's a constant struggle to find a good balance. You know, I, I'm not sure it's become riskier. I do think that people who want to wish us harm are better able to blow up our embassies than they have been in the past. But people don't realize that we've been at risk for a long time, whether it used to be that we would go on ships that would sink and we would get engaged in countries where we'd get deathly ill because there was no medical care or we had our diplomats in Vietnam, we had our diplomats in El Salvador and Honduras in the days when it was quite dangerous. So I think we are more aware of our diplomats when they are in danger than we used to be, and therefore it appears that we are more in danger. But then there are, are also, you know, these groups that are, can now blow up buildings, and that was harder in the past. Although Beirut, I mean, Beirut was how long ago, and they, they blew up the embassy. So I'm not sure it's necessarily more risky from my perspective. I don't know, a security officer may have a better educated answer to that. So um, I had served in Rwanda for three years and towards the end of my three years I started the day and I thought I am bored. Like I, I'm bored. I hadn't been bored in years. And I thought, wow, I remember what being bored feels like. And thought, well, I better not jinx myself, and then immediately jinxed myself. And got a call. There was a US citizen who was working for the United Nations in Eastern Congo. And the Congolese rebels had detained him. And so the United Nations was calling saying, hey, you've got this US citizen detained by Congolese rebels in Eastern Congo. Now, I was not allowed to go into Congo because we were pretty clear that, you know, as diplomats in Rwanda, you don't cross the border into Congo. But we got special permission for me to go because it would take too long for a consular officer from Kinshasa to come. I called up the head of external security and said, I'm going to Congo. I expect you to work with the rebels to ensure I have access to this U.S. citizen to ensure his safety. And the Rwandan was like, well, you know, we don't have anything to do with Eastern Congo. There's nothing I can do to help. You know, you can't even cross over. And I'm like, well, one, I can. And two, I understand politics, but politics are over. I have a US citizen detained by rebels. If you don't give me access to him and anything happens to him, that's it. Our relationship's over. The United States is not going to support you anymore. And I could make that threat. And I get to the border and I didn't really know what was gonna happen. Crossed the border, got a phone call. It was a US citizen. He said, I was just released as I crossed the border. We played chicken with the Rwandan government. And the rebel leader, whenever he released the US citizen, said to him, you're lucky you're an American. Now, it was still daylight and I should have gone back to Kigali. But I waited to call my boss so I could hang out with this U.S. citizen in Goma for the night because I really wanted to know more about what was going on in Goma and what his situation was. And this U.S. citizen was so thankful. He's like, I, I saved him from a horrible kangaroo court. And so we sat and drank beer on the shores of Lake Kivu, just sharing stories. Turned out he also had a Mennonite background. And it was lovely, and it really was one of the most memorable experiences as a Foreign Service officer. Oh, absolutely. I was a consular officer in Rwanda, but I was also the economic and commercial officer. And then in Calcutta, as the U.S. Consul General, a huge portion of my portfolio was promoting the sale of U.S. products in India. And I am incredibly proud, actually, of what we did to sell. And I, I, I know coal is not the most popular subject, but in India, they mine a lot of coal. And they mine it in a very efficient, inefficient way. And we compete with the Chinese. 
So the U.S. has amazing coal company, coal, I have to start over. The United States has amazing factories that produce high-end coal equipment that is worth millions of dollars. I mean, this company in Indiana employs so many thousands of people because they build some of the best coal mining equipment in the world. But they compete with China. And China comes into India and says, I can give you something cheaper, I can give it quicker, and I come in and say, I can give you the best in the world. And I'm gonna help you get it. And I worked with the chairman of Coal India to persuade him, to persuade the Ministry of Coal that U.S. products were significantly better than these cheap, fast products that China was offering. And in the end, this company in Indiana got a multi-million dollar, 12-year contract that was not just equipment, but also maintenance. And I knew I was saving people jobs because th this was work that really happened in the United States. It was a U.S. company, but jobs in the States. And I helped India get higher quality coal mining equipment that will hopefully be more efficient than the Chinese equipment that they would have bought if they didn't buy American. Absolutely, absolutely. This is the core of what we do. We call it economic diplomacy. It's how do we open markets to U.S. products? How do we make sure Americans have a fair, um, a fair competition when they're bidding on contracts overseas? How do we make sure they have a leg up when they're competing with other companies? We also work on, on um, investment in, in other countries to build ties and relationships. But really the most important is let me create jobs by selling products to other countries. But let me also create jobs by encouraging travelers and students and tourists to come to America. You know, it's a huge industry for us and an economic boon when people come and visit the United States. And so we promote the United States in that way saying, hey, if you're eligible for a visa and you don't wish us harm, please have your vacation here. This is way better than any other country in the world for you to come on vacation.